Thanks so much, Margaret, for the introduction and for having me back again this year. Oh, if you want to hit the uh, just this slate, it would be great. <laughs> that way people can see the slides a little bit better. Um, I was here just about a year ago. I know it was just before St. Patrick's Day last year and talked about a few other authors in this study that I'm doing. I'm writing a book right now called uh, Irish American Fiction, World War II to JFK. So this is two more authors. I didn't want to uh, cover the same exact ground, but I, the couple slides at the beginning uh, will sound familiar to the few of you who were here both years, but I'll go through those quickly. I just wanted to give some of the historical background before getting into these, these two authors. So um, these, well, the Irish American authors in my study observe Irish Americans changing in this period right after uh, World War II, um, giving up some of what made previous generations Irish uh, to become more American or to, to achieve the success American style. Um, and I'm finding a whole bunch of little novels, not little, <laughs> regular size novels from the time period that are often semi-autobiographical in nature. Um, and this, I'm finding this trend, basically, of authors who are left-leaning, uh, kind of politically and socially progressive, and they're worried about the larger Irish American community and and some of the, um, well, more conservative views that they're taking on um, in the name of preserving the wealth that they've now achieved um, and also in the name of being respectable uh, Americans. So. This is the, the setting, basically. Um, and these authors are usually trying to make sense of who they are as Irish Americans and who um, Irish America is going to be. So these are the, these couple slides. I did show some of this last year, or at least this, this one. Um, and basically, you know, coming into the 20th century, about 1900, um, according to the same historian, Kevin Kenny, there are about five million first and second generation Irish in America at the turn of the 20th century. And as I told people last year and kind of got a little bit of a gasp from the crowd, <laughs> um, that was more Irish in America at that moment uh, in 1900 than in Ireland. Uh, and that would be the first generation, so the immigrants who came over and then children born to those immigrants, about, about five million. As of the 1920s, things started to peter off um, because of restrictive immigration legislation. So it really slowed things down. And then the Great Depression slowed things down because obviously most Irish came here for work. And when they were hearing back home that the work was not here, they, they were not going to come this way anymore. So those things um, added up to a slowing down of immigration. You can see. Um, goes from, in the 1920s, about 220,000 Irish come over to the U.S., but that number drops all the way down in the 30s to 13,000, and then in the 40s goes back up just a tiny bit to 26, almost 27,000, but still way, way low compared to what it had been, um, which is why I think the authors who are writing in this later 40s, um, they're seeing a big difference in what they knew in their childhoods, um, say in the first decade of the, the 20th century or into the teens, uh, where there were lots of Irish American or Irish immigrants uh, living in their communities. Their grandparents' generation for most of these authors were Irish immigrants. And it, by the 40s, that generation is, is dying off. Um, and most of the people are second or third generation Americans and they are um, feeling more and more distanced from their Irish roots and trying to figure out who they are at that point, who they're gonna be in this country um, as Americans of, of Irish descent. Um, World War II brings about some additional changes, especially with the returning 
soldiers. Um, they're, they're finding the GI Bill is helping them get into a social class that they had not been in before. So they are able to go to school and go into professional careers in greater numbers than than ever before. And again, that's from Kevin Kenny. It's a great little book uh, if you're interested in Irish American history. Um, pretty uh, simple, straightforward, called The American Irish. Uh, so I'd recommend that if you want to, to know more about all of this. He does a great job. Uh, let's see. So there is that. So here are some of the tensions that come up in these novels that I'm working on, um, which were novels that were, they were popular at the time. They were view, reviewed in the New York Times, the Boston Globe, um, Providence Journal, some of them, uh, and they got quite a bit of, of coverage, but mostly, for the most part, they're novels that nobody knows of anymore. They're out of print, and um, they're just, you can find them, though, Maybe you could find them at a library sale. <laughs> I think some of the ones that I've found online, they are stamped with, with library things. So at one point, they were on a, in a library's collection, um, but now being, being sold off. Um, so, but this group of novels, and I'll talk about two of them in a minute, um, they address some of these, these issues that are kind of tensions that are coming into, um, that there are, these authors are observing in Irish American life. Um, and one of them is about labor unions and labor activism. And as you might know, the Irish were, were very active in labor unions. Um, but also at this point, the Irish were becoming business owners too. And so there's a, there's a conflict between whether um, to support those labor activists or um, to support the, the owners of the business. And really that comes down to um, kind of in these books and probably in real life too, um, your feelings about capitalism and, um, and kind of unfettered capitalism at the expense of workers' salaries, vacation time, weekends, things like that. Um, and then another tension that gets brought up in, in especially in one of these novels, um, but really actually in both, uh, is the role of the Catholic Church. You know, not all the Irish here in the United States were Catholic, or in Ireland for that matter, um, but of course the vast majority were, and the Irish Catholic hierarchy, mostly, they were Irish Catholic bishops at this point um, in the United States, in New York City, in Boston, places like that. Um, <laughs> They vary, they're not all the same, but these authors are challenging the ones who are more conservative, um, more apt to be attracting middle class or wealthy donors to the churches than to take care of the poor. Um, so there's, there's some bitterness around this, and um, as you'll see in one of the books especially. Um, so it's this idea that as the Irish rose up that ladder that they um, were working to rise uh, since they arrived famine era and in the decades after that. As they rose, they started to accumulate some property and then they started to in turn want to protect that property and the prosperity they had gained. What these authors are looking at is, is that at the expense of others who are coming in um, or you know, others who are still in the, the working class. Uh, and then, of course, the fear over losing these things that you've gained can turn into uh, a form of, of bigotry. And you had Irish Americans on both sides of these issues. Uh, and the protagonists in the novels are usually like the novelists themselves, kind of the left-leaning um, pro-labor, um, pro-working class kind of folks. We'll see. So these are the two novels I want to talk about today, and that, that picture jumped up a little higher than it was <laughs> um, earlier when I looked at this slide, but that's all right. Moon Gaffney, uh, which is by Harry Sylvester, and Lace Curtain by Ellen Berlin. Uh, and I'm going to talk about each of those authors in a second. Um, 
but I just want to talk about, um, yeah, I've gone off script. Uh, <laughs> a little more background, I guess, on that time period. The other thing that's happening uh, just after World War II, um, you have a, a second Red Scare. So you had it in 1919-1920 time period um, when our, the authors I'm talking about here would have been in their teens, um, late teens. And then you have it again at the end of World War II where, um, you know, it, it, uh, Folks are worried about Russian aggression in Europe um, and about communism taking over outside of there. And this is a big fear that you see come up in the, the rhetoric used um, by the, the more conservative kind of characters in the, in the books. Uh, so the authors would have known about this from earlier in their life, from their childhoods. They would have been well versed in um, you know, the, the fears around communism and socialism. Um, but interestingly, in between, you have the Great Depression where um, the, there's another great book, Voices of Protest, um, Huey Long, Father Coughlin, and the Great Depression by Alan Brinkley, uh, where he talks about how in the 1930s, the Catholic Church actually was, was much more um, socially progressive and advocating for um, the government to intervene uh, and to, in measures like the New Deal to, um, to help the poor and the working class out of, out of the, uh, the rut that they're in. Um, so the Catholic leadership at the time called for a combination of federal programs and employer responsibility to keep people out of abject poverty. And there are these papal encyclicals that they're basing, the bishops who are in favor of like New Deal legislation are basing their, um, their thoughts on that talk about uh, the dignity of all human beings and the dignity of workers. So there is um, a papal encyclical in 1931 urging believers to follow the teachings of St. Thomas Aquinas, quote, to oppose the unjust economic conditions that had created the present crisis. So there is um, Catholic theological backing for um, helping the poor, which shouldn't have to be explained probably, but um, there was great controversy over that. The business owners were then turning around and saying, who are you to tell me what I can and cannot pay my workers and that kind of thing. Um, so you've got um, that kind of blurring and changing around the World War II period where you have um, a, always the church was anti-communism, but you have really that become a, a more of a focus. So you've got, and, and they're, the church is worried about labor unions that may be leaning towards um, socialism and communism. And you've got Irish Americans kind of in the middle saying they want to be faithful to their church, but they also want to be, um, you know, to, to advocate for themselves as employees. So there's some confusions around all this. Um, so, and you've got Catholics on both sides of... Just after World War II, you've got a definition for, of, of what Irishness is that these authors are trying to think through, but also, also a definition of what American Catholicism would be. So on one side, you've got uh, this, the radio priest, uh, Father Charles Coughlin, if you've heard of him, um, who, who started out um, you know, in the 20s doing mostly like religious radio shows, but then by the uh, mid-30s, where he's hugely popular, um, he starts to to do these anti-Semitic rants and um, just becomes sounding more and more paranoid and uh, lashing out against the international bankers. Of course, he's blaming that on Jewish people uh, who would be out to kind of take over the American economy and and all of this. Um, he had a huge following in the 30s, um, early 30s, and then kind of lost favor with, with the White House and um, 
anybody else who thought he went kind of too, too far, uh, right? So you've got a priest like that. Then you've got uh, socially progressive bishops, but you've also got someone, um, a lay person named Dorothy Day, who um, was a convert to Catholicism, but she was, um, uh, well, she's actually now being considered for sainthood at this point. And um, during her lifetime, started uh, with others the Catholic Worker Movement and ran shelters. She lived in the shelter she ran in New York City, um, lived basically by a vow of poverty, though she didn't take um, vows, so to speak. And she becomes a, a model of the kind of Catholic, especially in this Moon Gaffney book, which I'll get to in a second, that, um, that a progressive, socially progressive person might want to emulate. Um, so these two novels, uh, you find all of these trends, all this historical stuff filtered into the imaginations of authors such as Harry Sylvester and Ellen Berlin. Uh, they're both leftward leaning in their political and social views. Um, in Sylvester's Moon Gaffney, Dorothy Day actually appears as a hero who seems destined for sainthood, as she might rightly be. Um, and Harry Sylvester, the author, actually knew her in real life and um, had a correspondence with her and um, probably did, as Moon Gaffney does in this book, probably did go into the, the Catholic worker shelter and volunteer there as well. Um, and then in Lace Curtain, it references radio priests who are these bigoted um, outlandish figures. It never names uh, Father Coughlin, but probably he would be the one that someone in this time period would have been thinking of um, as, as a, you know, uh, a bigot and a bully, basically. Um, the heroes in these books often face an uphill battle with, with few allies in the cause for social justice. Uh, they're set in opposition to those who are greedy and bigoted and um, who are those greedy and bigoted folks are painted as false Christians, uh, Christians in name only, basically, uh, who they've forgotten their, their immigrant roots, they've turned their back on their working class roots, and uh, to some extent, their, their Christian teachings as well. Um, so all this historical background provides this context for understanding these two novels. Uh, the authors here are asking the readers if they'll forget the poverty from which they came now that they've gained some political and economic power in the United States. And they're asking if they'll forget what it means to be Irish and what it means to be Christian as newer immigrants and other racial and religious minorities face oppression and poverty. Um, so uh, just, just a quick glance at these covers for a minute. I mean, most of you have probably heard the term lace curtain in reference to the Irish. Um, and I think if you look closely enough, it, they probably feature, obviously it's in the lace curtain cover, but I think you see some lace curtains in the, in the windows there and a very well-dressed man coming down the front steps of this uh, apartment building in New York. Um, presumably, probably the title character, Moon Gaffney, who's a young lawyer and does descend the steps of his, his parents' apartment building a couple of times in the novel. Um, the lace curtains, you know, represent a separation. Uh, to some extent, they represent the, the status that the Irish have, have gained in the country by this point, um, and also kind of a distancing oneself from um, one's neighbors, maybe, um, but also, and this, this air of respectability and, and wealth that uh, was important um, at this point, okay? So I know Lace Curtain, this kind of looks like a, a mystery novel, <laughs> the way the shadowy figure is in the background. It's not. It's more of a coming-of-age story and a, a love story in some senses um, than, than mystery. It's an interesting cover choice. But I think she's putting the Lace Curtain there. She's, there's actually a, a mixed-faith marriage in the, in the book, and I think the curtain is probably showing the divisions between husband and wife. Uh, that's my that's my take on it anyway. Uh, so we'll take a look at these two authors 
for a moment. So Harry Sylvester, um, born in 1908 in Brooklyn, uh, was the son of a Jewish American father and Irish American mother. Um, Harry's grandfather, Jeremiah Curtin, is, uh, was born to Irish immigrant parents in Canada and just, just a couple years after they came over or maybe within the year after they came over. Um, he's, Jeremiah Curtin's born in 1850 in Canada, so he would be, his parents would have been part of that famine immigration. Um, and sadly, Jeremiah's father dies in 1852, so just two years after Jeremiah was born. So you can imagine that life was probably tough for the Curtins um, with the mom with, I think it was, I think three of his older siblings were born in Ireland, so they brought them over to Canada and then another Jeremiah and maybe one other born in Canada. Um, so she had her hands full uh, with, with the husband who died soon after. Um, somehow, I don't, we don't have this information, but somehow uh, Jeremiah ends up in Brooklyn where he has his own family, including um, Harry's mother, Margaret. Um, all three of Jeremiah's children are born in Brooklyn. And by the way, I should say that all of this information, or much of it, uh, comes from the Georgetown University Library. Um, they have Harry Sylvester's papers in their archives. So I spent a couple of days there in the fall to go through loads of personal correspondence. And he has actually um, some genealogical information uh, kind of tracing the family tree a little bit. But interestingly, only on his mother's side. There's nothing in there. He does, he mentions in like one letter um, that his father was, I forget even how he puts it. it, doesn't say my father was Jewish. It's kind of like a dance around that a little bit. Um, he talks about some criticism of, of his novel coming from bigoted people who maybe knew that his father, I think one of the, I want to say it was, it's in one of the Boston newspapers, unfortunately, where they criticize him and they allude to the fact that he is part Jewish. Um, so that's the only mention of it, um, but he's named after his father, who was also Harry Aaron Sylvester. Um, so he really, he plays up more or identifies with more his, his Irish side. He's raised Catholic. He goes to Notre Dame University. He graduates from there in 1930. He actually played football for Newt Rockney um, and he ran track there at Notre Dame as well. Um, so very much in the way he's described in newspapers in the time, he's an Irish, he's an Irishman from Brooklyn. You know, they kind of negate that other side. Um, but he certainly identified as Catholic, and um, he, he talks quite a bit about the Catholic Church, which he eventually leaves, but that's, that's another story much later than, than this stuff is, is happening. Um, so he comes back to work. Uh, sorry, that filled the, filled the screen a little bit too much. He comes back to New York City after graduating Notre Dame and he becomes a, a newspaper um, writer and then he publishes the one early novel, Big Football Man, which I have not seen anything about, um, but then more in the 40s starts really writing quite a bit. Um, and the three novels in the middle, Dearly Beloved, Day Spring, and Moon Gaffney, all have to do with, with Catholicism in some way, shape, or form. Um, so I say there, you know, they exhibit his concerns or obsession, you could even say, with the teachings of the Catholic Church, especially around chastity and divorce. And we'll see this from, from some of the characters in the book in a second. Um, just after he published Moon Gaffney in the spring of 1947, just within six months, he gives a talk, um, I forget at what university, but that talk becomes published in um, Atlantic, the Atlantic in January 1948 called Problems of a Catholic Writer, of the Catholic Writer. And in that talk, he basically says, this is a short summary, <laughs> um, that 
if the Catholic writer was not so hemmed in by um, rules against divorce and especially against birth control, that he would have more time to write. Um, but the fact that the church is pushing for these large, large families um, is really problematic uh, to him and other Catholic writers, he says. And that um, take away from him being able, not just him, the Catholic writer being able to focus on, on his career. To say nothing of the women who might have been um, parenting those same children. Um, but he says the Catholic writer in general. Um, really interesting in those archives from Georgetown is the, this, there's a two-page um, kind of a summary. He must, have, he must have typed this up, I think, for court, probably custody reasons or something. Um, it's basically a, a summary of he and his wife's marital difficulties right around the same time Moon Gaffney is published and his wife's battle with depression as well. Um, and I th I'd love to write more about this, this couple. Maybe someday I will. Um, the report was clearly written by himself. Uh, the first bullet in the, the report is that Moon Gaffney was published and is to favorable reviews. <laughs> um, so he starts with kind of a, it's about him and it's about his novel. The interesting thing about that to me, well, the next bullet point is that his wife Rita was, um, was first complained of depression. Um, so in some of the correspondence that goes back and forth between him and friends at the time uh, that Moon Gaffney is published, friends are both congratulating him on the novel and congratulating him on, uh, and Rita on a new baby. Um, nothing in the summary of their marital problems says that the depression she's suffering may be postpartum depression. Obviously, we think more about that now, but he makes no mention in the summary, which is a bunch of dates and events, of a new baby, but he does talk about his novel coming out to favorable reviews. So um, just interesting stuff. He finally, um, they're clearly struggling. Their children, their older children are being kind of watched by different people at this time as his wife is in and out of um, uh, institutions that he says she checked herself into. And they finally, they, they file for divorce in 1952, but because I think of the difficulty of divorcing, it takes a couple extra years before they're actually divorced. And I put that in with his writing just because he brings that up as an issue that prohibits him from being able to write. Um, so it's, it's part of all this. You'll see it factors into Moon Gaffney in a second. So, Moon Gaffney is a, a novel, the, the actual protagonist's name, his, his first name is Aloysius. I'm not sure where the nickname Moon comes from, but um, it's a novel about this young man um, who, he's working his way up in the Tammany political machine in New York City, um, probably set more like in the 1930s, but written in 47, or published in 47. Uh, but it seems to be um, more pre-American involvement in World War II uh, for, the, for the setting. Um, so Moon is like a young politician on the rise. He's a lawyer by training, but he's basically an errand boy at the point that the novel opens up for the boss, um, who's not named, um, but clearly in charge of the the political machine running New York City at the time. Um, and uh, Harry Sylvester makes it clear that he's not really pleased with newly wealthy Irish Americans who've, who've um, made their way up to the middle or even upper class. Um, he shows their disdain for the poor and bigoted attitudes toward other races and creeds, and that clearly disturbs him. But the main course of his criticism is reserved for the American Catholic Church, um, and in particular the priests and bishops who are more concerned with um, adding parishioners, with collecting money from parishioners, with kind of schmoozing with parishioners at their homes, um, than with helping the poor. And it's, it's a rant, I will say. It is, <laughs> it is a, it's a rant of a novel, but it's, it's interesting nonetheless. Um, so... It, you know, because the, 
as I said, the, the church hierarchy was so Irish, Irish American at the time, it's hard to extricate, you know, his rants against the church with his rants against uh, Irish America at the same time. Um, so any, you know, any fault with the direction of the church could be laid squarely at the feet of its Irish American hierarchy, and he does that with a vengeance. Um, but the interesting thing to me, I think, is that his criticism for the church comes out of a love for what it once was or what he thinks it should be, um, and uh, respect for the core principles of Christianity. Um, so reading between the lines of his, like these overdrawn, sometimes portrayals of, of somewhat evil clerics, you can find a, a blueprint for the direction that he thought the church should go uh, if we were to get back to the core values of Christianity. And he saw the best of Catholic Christianity happening already in Dorothy Day's Catholic worker home. So it was there. It was, you know, there were priests also who were, um, who were for the poor and for these principles that he thought the church should be for, but it was the, the leadership um, that was at fault in most of this. Uh, let's see. So he also saw Christianity at work in the labor movement in its mission of uplifting the working class and treating all human beings with dignity. Um, there's, there's a character in the, the book, Bart Schneider. He's not the main character. Moon Gaffney is the main character. But Bart Schneider is one of the people who starts to change Moon Gaffney's mind. And Bart Schneider sounds an awful lot like Harry Sylvester. He's, um, he's Jewish on his father's side. He's, um, you know, you've got Sylvester, you've got Schneider. Um, he's Irish on his mother's side. He's a graduate of Notre Dame where he played football. You know, all of it sounds an awful lot like Harry Sylvester. And Schneider is the first one to start voicing some of these complaints, but he introduces Moon to this guy, Ed Galvin, um, and other people at the Catholic Worker Shelter. Um, so Ed Galvin tells Moon, you can't go into a Catholic church in the city on Sunday, particularly in Brooklyn, but what they're talking about collections or fornication or having more children. I can't remember the last time I heard a sermon on charity, and charity is the keystone, the touchstone of Christianity. And this, I just took out one representative quote. There's a, quite a few quotes like that in the book um, from Schneider, from this guy Ed Galvin, from others who are really upset um, that the church is not so interested in advising people against, say, hating others uh, for their race or their creed and things like that, where he, f or for, um, you know, talking about uplifting the poor or whatever, all these messages that um, they feel the church should be working on instead of always to these characters and to Harry Sylvester, really, if you read his letters and stuff too, focusing on, um, you know, issues of sexuality, chastity, and um, prohib prohibiting divorce uh, and birth control and so on. Um, the other issue that, that comes up as a problem with both uh, some of the Catholic priests in the novel and just the Irish Catholics who have uh, obtained some sort of material prosperity is the bigotry. So another character, George Hennessy, a clerk of courts in Brooklyn with upper class pretensions, he shares the common belief among the middle and upper class Catholics of the time that unions are overrun with communists. And George tells Moon, that the union his lawyer's son-in-law um, is representing is a disgrace to the family. And he says it's led by, quote, Jew communists. Um, and George goes on to explain that unless we meet, the, this is a quote, unless we meet the Jew problem as it should be met, the existence of Holy Mother Church, our own very lives, will be threatened. Um, and so he's echoing a line of thinking from such sources as Father Coughlin, the radio priest. Um, you see loads of this in the book, and this is, this is Moon thinking about actually this exchange with, with George Hennessy, whom he's trying to reason with, um, and he thinks it was not an uncommon topic among a certain kind of Irishman he met every day, and it disturbed him, or perhaps it was the frequency and rage with which it was discussed that did. He remembered his father speaking of what flannel mouth fools some Irish were, 
for the old man felt that if a persecution started, the Irish would follow the Jews as its object. And this is what you know makes me think this is pre-World War II. It's, it's before um, they fully could understand what this kind of rhetoric uh, would, would lead to, um, as it did. And interesting, th in all of these novels I'm dealing with, just about all of them, there's an older Irish immigrant character, usually it's a grandfather. In this book only, I think, is it a father figure who is much more reasonable, much more understanding of um, that, you know, oppression for one group is just as bad as oppression for another group. And they understand coming from a working class or a poor immigrant background that we shouldn't be then turning this hate that was directed at us onto other groups. So usually it's a grandfather. You'll see that in Lace Curtain, it is a grandfather. In this case only, it's Moon's father, who um, has reached some prosperity himself. He's a fire commissioner. He's well connected in that Tammany machine. Um, but he's, he's stayed grounded. And he's actually stayed. That's why that apartment building picture is important. He stayed in Brooklyn where the other fire commissioner, it said, moved to like a Park Avenue uh, penthouse kind of thing. So um, we don't see enough, I don't think, of Moon's father in the book, but he's, he's a uh, important character to represent another kind of Irishness, you know, that understood that oppressed people should work together instead of against each other. Uh, so I'll just go on here to our other author, Ellen Mackey Berlin. Um, and she does pronounce it Mackey. That's what I, I have read, that uh, it looks like McKay, I know. But the family apparently pronounced it Mackey. Another fascinating character. Um, and you may, her last name may sound familiar to you. She is the wife of Irving Berlin. They were married for 62 years um, after a very contentious um, start in which she was um, disinherited from her Catholic family for marrying the Jewish immigrant Irving Berlin. Um, but before all that, <laughs> uh, she was born in Long Island. These people were beyond lace curtain. They were the richest of the rich, um, in fact, because her grandfather, John William Mackey, who was an Irish immigrant to the US, uh, came over and worked in California in the gold mines for a while, then went to Nevada, where he was among the few folks who st struck the silver in the Comstock load. Uh, he invested that money very wisely. He invested it in a, a transnational telegraph, I believe the first one, and um, was a multi-millionaire. I think some sources say billionaire before, um, before young Ellen came along. So I'll talk about Lace Curtin in a minute and how she sees the tensions of this. Her own family was, was another mixed faith family. Um, her mother was kind of old world, old money, I should say, Protestant, old New York, um, Protestant elite. She was a writer herself, Catherine Dewar Mackey. And um, the father's family is really interesting. So Clarence Mackey, Irish Catholic, uh, Irish American Catholic. Uh, the John William Mackey and his wife Louise, when they first got so wealthy, um, thought maybe they'd be accepted into New York society because they had so much money. Turns out that was not the case. They were still looked at as the lowly servant class Irish, no matter how much money they had. So they actually took off to Europe. They lived in Paris. Uh, I think they lived in England for a while. Um, where they, they cavorted with royalty and <laughs> um, the money mattered there more than their Irishness. And actually Clarence Mackey, uh, when Ellen is a, in her 20s, she's already kind of dating Irving Berlin at this time. Clarence Mackey um, hosts uh, the Prince of Wales at their, the then Prince of Wales at their, um, at their estate in Long Island. And Ellen dances with him 
but sneaks off and says, you know, I need to call this guy I'm dating. <laughs> if you distract my father, I can go call this guy. So the prince at the time um, was very amused by young Ellen, who was the only woman in America that wasn't like, you know, trying anything she could to marry him. <laughs> she wanted to go call her boyfriend. Um, so she, Ellen starts writing before she marries Irving Berlin. She um, is a debutante, as you see here in the picture, um, and she's in the high society New York scene, and she starts writing witty little pieces. Um, there's a piece on why she prefers the cabaret to, um, to these debutante boring debutante balls and things like that. And um, so she becomes quite famous actually in that world, that style and high fashion kind of world. And the, I forget the editor's name of the New Yorker at the time, but he credits her with basically saving the magazine. It's kind of a fledgling magazine at the time. And her piece on the cabarets was so popular that he gave her a lifetime subscription to, um, it, it, it made the New Yorker trendy apparently at the time. Um, so she happens to meet Irving Berlin, who's about 13 years older than her. And uh, when she's in her 20s, they fall in love, and it's a real love match. They, uh, like I said, are married for 62 years, um, but it does cause quite the controversy, and it was the big tabloid fodder at the time. All the tabloids, or their, the version of that existed at the time, were at the docks when they returned from their honeymoon. They tried to sneak back in through Canada so that no one would see them, but public word got out that they were coming back. So it was this whole big hoopla. And um, their only comment on it was, we're very happy. And they, that was their like press release. And, um, but her father kind of disowned her for a bit until, and this is more on this next slide, um, <laughs> I talked a little bit about that already. Um, this third bullet, just her, sadly, their, their son, Irving Jr., um, died of what we'd call SIDS or crib death um, now as, as a very young infant. He was their second child. And um, when that happens, her father shows up at the door and they kind of reunite, basically, in her, her grief. They had been very close. Um, and uh, that brings them back together. One thing I forgot to mention, which was on the previous slide you probably saw, was that the, the mother, Catherine Dewar, left the family when Ellen was about 10. She took off with this, all this crazy um, tabloid stuff. She took off with Clarence's father's doctor. <laughs> he had throat cancer, and she took off with his doctor, um, which caused quite a scandal then. From that point on, from the time she was 10, her father raised the kids as Catholics, um, but they had been reared as Protestant before that. Um, telling you all of this about the men in her life, and I know that's the wrong thing to do for a woman writer, but she does um, identify first as wife and mother, she says. Uh, their daughter, the Berlin's daughter, uh, Mary Ellen Barrett, wrote a memoir called Irving Berlin, A Daughter's Memoir. And it's really the story of both of them, you know, but obviously Irving was, was a little more popular. Um, probably most people know him, <laughs> I guess, but uh, you know, he wrote some 1500 songs and uh, including God Bless America and White Christmas, among many, many, many others that would have been uh, hugely popular from, I think the 19 teens through the 40s and into the 50s. So pretty much America's most popular songwriter for a good half of the 20th century. Um, so according to the daughter, and the memoir is really ends up being about the whole family, um, but according to the daughter, Ellen was, was very happy to be in her role as wife and mother, and she considered writing just a side um, venture and not something that should be the focus of her life. Um, so she does put it aside while she's a young mother. She goes back to it a little bit later. Um, seems to get her through a period of postpartum depression, uh, turning to writing. And um, 
and then she starts coming out with these novels starting in the 40s. So um, Lace Curtain is the one I'll, I'll focus on it today. She also, and sorry, these slides were, were better set up before, before I put them up here. Um, Silver Platter, which she published in 1957, she was very proud of. She did a ton of research into that Mackie side of the family and this striking silver, and especially it's, it's a tale of her grandmother, Louise, um, who was an Irish-American. She married the Irish immigrant, John William, and uh, became quite wealthy in the process. Uh, so it's her grandmother's story. But Lace Curtain is the one for today. Um, and it's, again, in this time period, so you've got Moon Gaffney published in 1947, you've got Lace Curtain in 1948. Last year I talked about a couple of other novels from 1946 and 1948. Uh, so there's a lot of Irish-American fiction coming out at this time, little regional novels, and they all seem to deal with, in different ways, but deal with this, um, you know, who are we going to be as, as American Irish or Irish Americans? Um, the issue in Lace Curtain is a little different. Veronica Reardon, who's the, the protagonist, she's the second youngest of eight children in an Irish-American family with the wealth and the Long Island mansion uh, reminiscent of the Mackeys. So she's in some ways a version of, of the author, in some ways not, which I'll talk about. Uh, so Veronica is an eight-year-old in 1916 when the novel opens. Uh, she's a constant observer of her older siblings, a role I know well, uh, being the youngest of eight myself. Um, and they are mostly in their teens at the time. So she's watching them. A lot of them get into, um, well, they kind of split. Some of them marry other Irish Catholics. And those marriages are seen as comfortable and safe, is the word used quite a few times. Others, um, because they've got the money of the, um, the upper, upper class of New York at the time, they're also socializing with uh, a lot of Protestants from that class. And those are always fraught with tension, those, those relationships. Uh, so young Veronica's watching all this. It doesn't stop her from falling in love with a Protestant um, and uh, eventually pleading with her family to be able to to marry him. Um, but as she's a young kid, there's a lot of, uh, let's say, she feels safe inside her father's big mansion. It's actually called Pride's Tower. Um, and so she always feels safe there. She feels safe with the other wealthy Irish Catholic families that are kind of around them. There's only maybe two others. Um, but these little worrisome episodes keep kind of interrupting her safety. So she's, she's pressured by girls at a skating rink um, to tell them about being Catholic. Uh, she's, they're Protestant girls and they're doing it in a not so nice way. She knows that they're, they're trying to make fun of her. Um, another time, a, a friend supposedly of her sister's who's Protestant, um, remarks on derisively on the size of their family, the big Irish Catholic family, and so on. So she starts, she hears these little things and it bothers her. Um, again, she, um, she ends up marrying into an upper class Protestant family against the protests of both families. Um, these two, Veronica and Jamie, kind of stick it out and they, they have, they're made to wait a year, but they do and they, uh, they eventually marry. There's still a lot of conflict in that marriage, though they try to, to keep that out. They, they vow to each other that they're going to keep their families out of their marriage, but it doesn't work out as well. So this is Veronica thinking about her, her mother-in-law, um, who's the, the stairs, her, her husband's family, are descended from a signer of the Declaration of Independence. They go back that far in... Um, the elite of New York and the United States. And Veronica thinks, she won't let me forget. I and my people are new. We don't belong to this hierarchy that has presented itself so carefully, that is determined to maintain itself. Our things are bought. She won't let me forget that. We can have taste, we can have money, 
but our things are bought. She never lets me forget that outward and visible sign of an in inward, invisible difference. Um, so interestingly, uh, according to the, the daughter's memoir, by the time Ellen Bro uh, Mackey was, was growing up, according to the daughter, she wasn't feeling this kind of being outside of the Protestant elite. Um, in fact, her mother was Protestant. They mixed quite frequently with others at social clubs and things like that. But this is almost a flashback to her grandmother's generation where she, was, um, she actually left the country because she was not welcomed into the upper class. So um, there's layers of bigotry in this novel, I guess, is what I'm seeing. And um, you've got Ellen Berlin in real life married to an immigrant um, son of Orthodox Jews, and Veronica in the novel married to um, a Protestant, and that's the big mixed faith issue is the Protestant Catholic marriage, whereas in her real life it was a Jewish Catholic marriage. Um, but some of the issues overlap. And uh, she has another character in the book whose mother leaves the family and that causes a scandal, kind of like her, her own life. She puts that onto a different character, a friend of Veronica's. Um, and there's another marriage in the book that's a mixed faith uh, Jewish and Catholic marriage. Um, a big issue that comes up in the book is uh, one of Veronica's brothers, who is not very stable emotionally, um, he feels left out, say, of a, a, a club that he wanted to belong to at Yale. Um, he's excluded for being Irish and being Catholic and so on. He turns that, what he's feeling, the bigotry that he experiences against himself, onto others, especially Jewish people. And again, this is in the years leading up to World War II that the, this part of the novel is set. And he's really just a horrible, <laughs> he says some horrible things. He approves of uh, violence against Jewish people to get them out of New York because it's funny, the Protestants in the book talk about the Irish taking over New York and then the Irish in the book talk about the Jews taking over New York. And it's just layer upon layer of this kind of thinking, um, which she's obviously criticizing here. So one of the voices of reason is Veronica's other brother, Jerome. And he's disgusted by this talk that he's hearing at a, at a dinner party. And he says, I just want to make it clear that what you and Eugene uh, were saying wasn't Irish talk. We Irish have learned to detest persecution. We learn the hard way. It wasn't Catholic talk either. We Catholic Christians remember the founder of our church and his people. And he goes on to tell, this is, he's talking to the Veronica's husband's uncle. He goes on to tell him, you know, it is a Judeo-Christian tradition that we're, we're living and all of this in this longer quote. Uh, so you've got always characters on both sides. You've got the bigoted, um, prejudiced characters and you've got the, those who would stand up for other groups, um, including, again, a grandfather character. Um, he's a grandfather of friends of theirs. Um, and all the kids who are Veronica's age, teen, early 20-somethings, I guess, at this point, are again criticizing um, Jewish people. Their grandfather has a Jewish law partner, and he's come over for dinner. This is after he leaves. They're wishing that he didn't have to come to the house. Um, and old Mr. Shea, the voice of, he, this, there would have, I would have filled the entire thing <laughs> with his rant, which is pretty long and great. Um, but in part of it, he says, we live in grand houses here, but it was a shanty I was born into in the old country, not Dublin Castle, and don't you forget it, because they're not only against Jewish people, but also against the shanty, the, the lower class Irish. Um, so always a great character like that to remind people of what we're supposed to be. Um, and I'll just wrap it up with uh, um, just some, some final thoughts on the two novels together and these two authors together. Um, they were both um, not 100% Irish. I don't know how many people are actually in reality. Uh, if you do those DNA tests, you'll find. Um, there's always other stuff mixed in there. But they clearly had, you know, 
a Catholic Irish parent at, or an Irish American parent and a um, non-Irish, non-Catholic parent, but they both identified strongly with their Irish Catholic roots, um, both born into mixed faith marriages, they're both New Yorkers, though brought up in very different social classes and, and neighborhoods. Um, Ellen Berlin is Long Island uh, royalty basically at that point, and uh, Harry Sylvester is presumably more working class um, Brooklyn. Uh, we've talked about that. Um, they're setting their books right before World War II, but writing them after World War II, and I don't think the atrocities of that war were lost on either of them. I don't think it necessarily has to do with them having Jewish family members, though they both do, uh, because the other authors, two of which I talked about last year, um, also have episodes of bigotry against Jewish people in their books, written at the, in the same years. Um, and they're, you know, trying to get their heads around how, as a people who were once oppressed, once poor, once immigrants, how we could then turn on somebody else um, in a similar situation. So in both books, uh, and by a lot of these authors, bigotry is something they address directly in their fiction as intolerable. And um, they both go back to their Catholic, Christian, Irish roots for the right way to be, uh, for, for serving the poor in, in Sylvester's book especially, and for standing up for um, the immigrant or the outcast or the oppressed in Berlin's book. That's all I have for you right now. Thank you. I welcome questions if we have any time. I know we started a little late, so I went a little long. Yeah. Anybody have questions or comments, thoughts? Jim. It's a lousy question, but I'll ask it anyway. Okay. Uh, uh, what's your sense about the literary quality of these people? Uh, I think it's a great question. Um, I would say if I had to put one against the other, Lace Curtain, I think is one that I would love to see reissued because I think it is a quality book. Uh, Moon Gaffney, I find better for historical purposes uh, than for its literary quality, I would say. It's, it's pretty, Harry Sylvester was a really angry guy, it seems, from everything I'm reading published and unpublished by him. And so it's a rant, you know, kind of a one-sided rant. Still entertaining, but that's not why I would tell people to read it, you know, for, for its literary quality. But. I don't know why they call him Moon. Um, I, it's his nickname. Uh, they never call, his real name's Aloysius, they never call him that. And I don't think it's explained. I'm pretty sure it's not explained in the novel. Just a nickname. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess better than Aloysius. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> uh, anybody else? Good. Can I just ask about your yeah. research and to, you know, where it's going in oh, sure. of your, your books and when you think you might be? Great question. Um, well, let's see. The Ellen Berlin chapter is in progress at the moment, and that's chapter six out of seven. So I'm, I'm nearly towards the end. I've got one more to do after that and a conclusion that I was half written anyway. Um, I'm in talks with Palgrave Macmillan, the publisher, to hopefully bring it out. Um, they've read the first 50 pages and asked to see the whole thing, which I take as better than a no. We don't want it. Um, so hopefully, uh, if not them, another academic press would be interested, I think. It, uh, having once tried to publish a novel, um, hearing and seeing it's much easier to get an academic book out there. It doesn't get very widely circulated and it might cost a ridiculous amount for a hardcover. But um, hopefully, I'm hoping in the next year or so that this is done. All, the, all my research is done. It's just a matter of pulling together the last couple chapters and uh, then seeing what First, Paul Grave McMillan says, since I've been talking to them, and if not them, I'll keep shopping it around. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, what made you decide to, to target this particular, these particular, this particular area, these particular authors, and, and how, do you, how do you see the connection to today? 
to now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, great question. Uh, so I should have maybe said at the beginning, this was one, well, not these books, but the original idea for this post-World War II time period came from my dissertation. It was one chapter of my dissertation, which more looked at Irish-American lit from the 1940s to the early 21st century. So it was more of a longer survey. When I went back to try to turn the dissertation into a book, I found that this was the most interesting time period. And part of it is because it's so relevant to, to now. Some of the issues that are being raised by these authors um, who are trying to figure out who we are as Irish Americans, you see them coming back again in the press when you know, you've got Bill O'Reilly and you've got... Um, uh, you've got Paul Ryan, and you've got a lot of Irish American names out there who um, who are proud of their Irish roots, um, but at the same time maybe advancing causes that are anti-immigrant. Um, uh, so a lot of loud voices, as you did have, you know, not only Charles Coughlin, but right after this, of course, you've got Senator Joseph McCarthy. Um, so a lot of loud voices <laughs> that, that might make like the grandfather characters in these books cringe, you know, um, that have forgotten who they were. So I think it's quite relevant to now. And in fact, the, my introduction talks about, it starts off talking about some of those Irish names that are in the, the spotlight in current uh, times and, and some of the backlash against that. There's a group called uh, Irish Stand out of New York who are um, pro-immigrant, um, trying to, to basically be an Irish voice for more socially liberal stance on immigration um, in response to these other, these other folks. Um, so that's, that's that, yeah. So, it was one chapter of my dissertation, and now I've blown it up. I had two authors in that chapter, and now uh, I guess I'm on six, at least six. Um, very interestingly, one author whom I don't know if I'll include, but apparently I could, is um, John Steinbeck, who is also half Irish. Um, and uh, in East of Eden, I know Jim will know, <laughs> uh, there's the Irish grandfather character, who is the wise and um, kind of socially progressive character in there as well. So if I want to add an eighth chapter, um, it's right in the same time, time period, really early 50s, I think, 51 maybe. Uh, so that would be another one. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks. Thank you.